Will you open the word of God with me? We're going to be looking at wisdom this morning. And will you stand with me as we open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 10? We're going to be looking at wisdom. And, you know, one of the responsibilities as the preacher is to preach Christ in everything. But I want you to know, how do I preach Christ when we talk about foolishness and wisdom? Well, in chapter Luke, or in in Luke, chapter 2, chapter Luke, in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, is a great verse. It says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. So when we look at Scripture and it talks about what wisdom is, it's a reflection of Jesus. So I just want you to know that when we look at wisdom, you can say, yeah, I see that in Jesus because Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and you and I were to grow and become like Christ, which means you and I are to grow in wisdom and in stature. So this is what, uh, this is a series of Proverbs here and it, it, Proverbs are wisdom writing. So let's just look at this. He who digs a pit will fall into it and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them And he who splints logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he uses more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is an evil madness. A fool multiplies his words, though no man knows what is to be. And who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool worries him, or wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility and your princes feast at the proper time. For strength and not for drunkenness. Though through sloth the roof sinks in. And through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter. And wine gladdens life. And money answers everything. Even in your thoughts do not curse the king. Nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice. Or some winged creature tell the manner matter. Father God, we have heard your words. I pray, Father, that you would preach a far better sermon than I can. I pray that you open our eyes, ears, hearts, and minds that we might be wise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I... I I love this section of scripture. I wanted to preach chapter 10 all at one time, but it was so rich, I had to break it into two parts. So this section, verses 8 through 11, uh, is one section, and it deals with disastrous accidents that happen in life when you are not prepared or cautious. In high school youth group at uh, Good Shepherd, I remember there was a, a girl that I had noticed right away when she came, and so I sat next to her, and I got to talk to her, and I asked her, um, what are you up to, what's going on, and um, where are you from? She had just moved here, her parents bought a house, they were building it, and, uh, and the next week at youth group, she wasn't there, and I asked her friend who knew her, I said, where's she at? Well, what had happened was, is her parents had bought a house, and her dad was driving a forklift. They were uh, remodeling the second story on their house, and she was driving the forklift, and she had a bunch of lumber on the forklift, and they were raising it up, and her dad had asked her if she could raise it up, and she was holding it there, and he wanted to go up into the second story, and he real quickly ran underneath the forklift, and a hydraulic hose broke, a, a coupling broke, and it crushed her dad right in front of him, right in front of her. It was an accident. It was a tragic accident that was really an unnecessary accident. And this passage here talks about tragic accidents. They do happen. It was horrible. It was traumatic. But it was totally preventable. It was an accident that could have been avoided if he would have realized 
walking underneath a forklift can be a mistake. And everything, by all means, everything looked fine. And, um, and then that family moved, and I never saw her again. But I just remember um, just, just the awfulness of this. That's, that's kind of what this is getting at here. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. Some of us have jobs that are dangerous jobs. Some of us work hard, and the work is dangerous. <clears throat> You, you have to understand, at this point in time when this passage was written, there was no workman's comp. There was no Aflac to pay the bills if you got hurt. You, to lose your ability to earn money meant that you lost, you had the potential to lose everything. That's why if you look at verse 19, we see that money answers everything. It's good to work hard and to work smart. I think another reason that this is in here is to help us realize we're frail. You know, when I was 20, 21, 22, I, I didn't think anything could happen to me. And I thought accidents always happened to someone else. But how, by the way, that's not true. There, there's good young people that, uh, that aren't all strong. And by the way, accidents do happen, and they happen even to me. Um, I've fallen off a ladder or two. I even fell off a roof one time. And nobody let up on telling me that. We don't want you up there. You fall off roofs. It happened once. How did I fall off the roof? I wasn't being cautious. I thought for just a split second, I didn't need that little safety rope. Just for us, I was just gonna go from here to there. It was just a little step, and the, the thing that I needed was just outside of the reach so I could unclip myself and just grab it for a split second. By the way, that's when accidents happen. They happen in that split second. How we prevent accidents actually reveals our wisdom. How we set ourselves up to prevent accidents reveals our wisdom. There's something to be said about safety and danger. You know, one of the things that a wise person does is they assess the situation where fools rush in. A fool does not see the potential dangers or they think that it doesn't happen to them. Have you ever been foolish? You know, common sense, my grandma would tell me this, common sense is not a flower that grows in everyone's garden. <laughs> Success is the fruit of wisdom. That's why I look at verse 10, we see that. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. You know, I was a raft guide in Montana, and I, I got trained. I went to a school, and I got certified to train other guides. And one of the things that they taught us in how to teach other people how to raft uh, through rapids is we tell people, we want to set you up for success. So one of the things that we would do to set ourselves up for success in a raft is we would pull over to the side of the river and we would actually look at the rapids that were in front of us. And we would see. Now, if you go to a difficult set of rapids, which is a class four or a class five, by the way, I've only done one class five and it was a great rapid that really needed to be assessed. Not only are you assessing the river that you're trying to navigate, you're also assessing the people that are paddling. Because just because you have the knowledge to get through the rapid does not mean that you have the skill set to get through it. And sometimes it's wiser to say, we can't do this. Let's pick the raft up and we'll walk around and we'll put it on the other side. You see, wisdom knows how to do that. So a wise person assesses the situation and they assess what they have in order to get through it. That's what this verse is talking about. It's talking about splitting wood. 
If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. You ever try to cut a tree down with a dull axe? You ever try to split wood with a dull axe? We use a splitting maul, and sometimes it just gets so round. I remember trying to split wood with a splitting maul. I thought the, the strength, I was, my, my grandmother, bless her heart, in order to teach me character, ordered five cords of unsplit wood and said, Sean, I want you to split that and stack it. Why? Because you need character. I don't know how I got character. I got blisters. But I had to split all that wood, and it was wet wood, so we had to stack it in a certain way, which meant that I had to pay more attention to the details because you had to stack the wood one way and then come across. And Have you, anyone ever sp- stack wet wood? That's how you're supposed to stack it. It's not fun. But this is saying here that if the iron is blunt one does not sh- and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. This is saying work smart. If you work smart, sharpen the edge, take a few minutes to sharpen the edge, you don't have to exert so much effort, and you can do the same thing with less effort because you can do it smarter. Well, there's something about safety and smarts and work and smarts. You know, when you're young, you can work hard. When you're a little older, you can work smart, even better as one who can do both. It makes sense that a dull axe will not cut as sharp as as well as a sharp axe. But if you're strong, you can work with a dull one. But if you're smart, you'll stop and you'll sharpen it. You know, what are ways that we can sharpen our blade? I was thinking about this. Here's one way in life that we can set ourselves up for success. At least for me, I'm ADD. And if you don't know what that means, uh, it just means I can't pay attention for the life of me. That's really what it means. But how do we set ourselves up for success? How can I set myself up for success? How do you set yourself up for success? One of the ways that we can set ourselves up for success, at least for me, is do not wait until the last minute to do an assignment or a project. Because when you wait till the last minute, you might think you do well under pressure, but let me tell you something, you do a lot better if you prepare all the way through. If you have two weeks to do a project, don't wait till that last day. That's just one way, but somehow I think that I do well in that last minute. Here's another way that you can set yourself up for success. Realize the tools that God has given you and use them wisely. I don't know if you know this, but God has given you a body. And one of the ways that we can be wise with our body to set ourselves up for success is we can eat right. We can get enough sleep. We can exercise. We can take care of the bodies that God has given us so that we can function properly in life. I know that's a little common sense. But you know, I went to this men's retreat uh, with a bunch of people at the CB. Ron, correct me if I'm wrong on this. But did you notice that most of the men that were there were overweight? You know, why is it that most Christian men are overweight? Because we're not good stewards with the body that God has given us. If we want to set ourselves up for success in work, you can do that in safety, but you can also do that in taking care of yourself. Eat right, exercise, get enough sleep. Verse 11. If the serpent bites before it is charmed... There is no advantage to the charmer. Let me share with you something about snake charming. I don't know a whole lot about snake charming, but I do know this. There's no junior varsity snake charming team. <laughs> like if you get bit by the snake, you're off the team. That's it. You're dead. So, so what is this proverb telling us? What is the point of this verse? You know, there are some things that require so much attention to detail that one mistake could kill you. And what happens is people become comfortable. They become comfortable. When they become comfortable, they become complacent. And when you become complacent, you make mistakes. And some of those mistakes can be costly. 
I was reading a story about a 17-year-old kid that was one of the world's best rock climbers, and he had a rock climbing area that was near his house, and uh, he would go there frequently, and he would see how fast he could climb it, because one of the things, I guess, that makes you a great rock climber is speed. But the problem was, is he climbed so fast, people couldn't belay him. So he just decided he would do it without a rope because he'd done it so many times and he was always trying to improve his speed and he knew where all the the holds were and you watch him climb up this thing and it looked like he was crawling across something horizontal and he did it so fast with so little effort because he knew exactly where everything was and he had done this climb thousands and thousands of times in his life but one time when he did it in great speed, a rock that he had always grabbed came loose. And he fell about 80 feet on jagged rocks and broke his back and became a quadriplegic because he was in such a hurry and he became so familiar that he didn't think anything could happen to him. And let me tell you, there are things in our life that when they first happen, you become so scared. You're you're totally tuned in and, and attentive to the details but we get so familiar because we've seen it so many times that we let our guard down and we think that everything's fine. I've, I can handle this. I can do this with my eyes closed. I can, I've done this so many times that nothing's going nothing's to go wrong. You know, I, I imagine the first time you're a snake charmer that you're there and someone's telling you what to do, you're listening. Okay, this thing will kill you. It will kill me. But we get so complacent that we put ourselves in situations that we think that nothing can go wrong. You know, there's two areas that I think of right away that it's dangerous to be complacent with. One of them is purity in our world today. We have got to fight for purity. You know, I tell tell Chase, who's with youth, I I tell Chase, Chase, don't preach abstinence. You can't take abstinence into a marriage. Teach purity, because you can take purity into a marriage. Don't let your guard down on purity. We've got to fight for purity. In our world today, we live in such a world where modesty is out the window and compromise is everywhere, that somehow we think that just because you haven't fallen morally, it won't happen to me. But yet there have been great godly men who have fallen morally because they've let their guard down. The other thing that I would say that we need to absolutely protect, that we can't let our guard down, is our marriage, our family, your kids. Marriage is a gift. I was so scared on my wedding day. I mean, I was terrified. The day that my kids were born, I was petrified. I can't keep a plant alive for six months. What am I going to do for 18 years? Don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard down in your marriage or with your kids. What's our takeaways from this section? Wisdom sets us up for success. When you have a project, when you have something you need to do for work, assess the situation, see what the dangers are, find out what you need to do to prevent yourself from from getting hurt or getting injured. Assess the tools and the materials necessary to do the project. Here's a, here's a little secret. I don't know if you know this, but one of the best ways to do a project is to use the right tool. If you use a crescent wrench as a hammer, it doesn't work that well. I've tried it. You can also use a rock. It doesn't work that well. You know what makes the best hammer? A hammer. So assess the situation. See what tools you need and get the right things. Consider all the things that could go wrong. Prevent yourself from making a mistake, pay attention to the details, and when you do that, you have wisdom and you'll set yourself up for success. I tell my kids the five Ps, proper preparation prevents poor performance. That's the five Ps of success. You know what, I'm learning, going through Ecclesiastes, it's biblical. (laughs) I didn't know that. This is not saying if it's too dangerous, don't do it. What it is saying is you can prevent yourselves Uh, from putting yourself in harm's way if you do it wisely, if you do it safely, if you do it properly. Verses 12 through 15. This deals with fools. 
if you live in the world, if you've dealt with yourself, you've dealt with fools. Remember, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. And so I'm not trying to single anybody out here, but if the shoe fits, wear it and examine yourself and say, please don't let me be a fool. I've been, I, I've, I've met this, the criteria many times in this section, especially as a pastor with many words. So let's look at it. Verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor. But the lips of a fool consume him. Wise words bring favor. In other words, wise people make the situation better. People want the wise person around. But the lips of a fool consume him. Well, I've had to look that up in the Hebrew there, the word consume him, to understand it. That means it could also be translated overwhelmed by calamity. It could also be translated as filled by greed. So the, the foolish person, the foolish person's speech brings destruction. His words ruin the whole culture. His speech is so self-centered that it is obnoxious. Have you ever met that person? Yep, don't say their name. They're probably here, it's probably me. Please forgive me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amen, please forgive me. If we take this just a little bit further, we see something here. I wanna take this just a little bit further. Uh, the words of the wise man. The words of the wise person benefit others. It makes others better. Your words actually make others better. Others are blessed by what you have to say, and you bring joy to the situation. Wisdom considers the risks, makes the necessary adjustments to prevent danger, and provides a safe environment physically, emotionally, relationally, socially. Foolishness is selfish, and it takes from others. Others suffer. The fool brings pain. Foolishness rushes in and hurts themselves and creates environments that harm others as well. God wants us to be wise. Verse 13. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is evil madness. Let me explain. This is really simple. The fool begins with silly speech and just keeps talking to the point of insanity or absurdity. They just can't shut up. They're so self-absorbed, they don't even know it. They're the only ones there that think that you want to listen. <laughs> Verse 15. Oh, sorry, let me go back to Ecclesiastes 1.15. 1 1.15 1 says this. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. Now, let me explain that. I said before when I preached on Ecclesiastes 1, you can't fix stupid. This was the passage that I used. The foolish person that just keeps going on and on and on and on, even when you explain to them how obnoxious that is, they don't get it. But you know what that means? You need to pray for that person because the only thing that can fix stupid is something supernatural is God, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit imparts wisdom. So when we're around fools or around people who call themselves Christians and they are behaving foolish, we need to pray. We need to pray for them. Can you speak up? Yes, but don't think that your words are going to be the thing that does it. Don't think, to, how many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? There's some parents in here that are nodding. Pray. Let God open their eyes. Let God open their ears. Let God open their hearts because with God, all things are possible. And we need to remember that. We need to have patience with foolish people, but we need to realize that we can't straighten them out. We can't add to their logic. Only God does that. Verse 14. A fool multiplies words. Though no man knows what is to be and who can tell him what will be after him. 
What does this mean? It means that the fool drivels on and on about things they have no idea about. They are an expert at everything, and they can tell you what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and they talk like they're the expert. I think of myself when I was about 17 to 20, 25. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what it took to get there, and I had no idea what I was talking about. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. You know, James was a pastor uh, in Jerusalem, and he dealt with people. And when you're a pastor and you deal with people, if you're a person and you deal with people, you deal with fools, right? And James spoke to people who kind of talked like they knew everything and they knew what they were going to do and they knew how they were going to get there. And and in his letter, he says this. In chapter 4, verse 13 of James, he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. He says, you have no idea what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, I didn't, I didn't think about that at first. But I didn't equate foolishness with evil, but James does. Foolishness is evil because it does not reflect the nature and the character of God. Anything that reflects the nature and the character of God is holy. Anything that does not reflect the nature and the character of God is evil. And what I didn't realize as, as I'm going through this in Ecclesiastes and then when I looked at James is that foolishness is evil. It's sin. God has given us a mind. God has given us ability to discern. God has given us gifts and talents and strengths. And we don't use that And when we don't use that, we act a fool. And it's not right. It's not good. It's not what God desires. Now look at verse 15. There's two ways to translate verse 15, but let's look at it. The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Here's the two ways you can translate that. And, And both ways are valid and both ways are good. And maybe God has allowed the Hebrew to give us both interpretations. Here's the two ways that it's been interpreted. First of all, the fool is so self-absorbed that he cannot even pay attention to where he is going or how to get back. That's the first way to do that. The fool is so self-absorbed that they're not paying attention. They don't know where they're going or how to get back where they came from. The second way to interpret this is that the fool has worked so hard physically, he's so exhausted that they are too weak and too tired to even know how to get back home. Both ways, uh, according to the commentaries that I have, are proper interpretations of that. Some people want to take a stance on it. I say let both stand, because sometimes God's word is able to do that. But either way, the bottom line is the fool is lost. Anyone work with the fool? Anyone, can you relate to, to the word of God? Isn't it amazing how relevant Scripture is. There is nothing new under the sun. Foolishness has been foolishness, has been foolishness, has been foolishness. This next section deals with the king or authority. So look at verse 16. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Let me just share with you. There's two kinds of leaders. There's good leaders and there's bad leaders. And if you are a leader, this is a good thing to pay attention. If you're a boss, if you have responsibility over people, this is a good thing to learn from right here. We can pay attention. Verse 16 Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child. That's immature. And your princes feast in the morning. You know, an immature king, an immature leader, is so self-absorbed that they're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Wisdom knows when to do the right thing at the right time, in the right place, with the right people. 
Mornings in this time was made for hard work in the cool of the day. And feasting was for the end of the day with all of the workers as a reward for the hard work. So what's this passage saying? Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, when he's so self-centered and he's focusing only on himself and everybody else is working and everybody else is slaving away and the king's like, not me. Not me. It's, this is all about me. You know, there was, there's a verse in Scripture about King David. And it says, at a time when kings were off at war, the king was supposed to be with his men off at war. That was the right time, the right place, the right thing for the king to do. And David was not in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. He stayed back. And that's when he got in big trouble with Bathsheba. You see, a good king is out with his people, working with his people, because he cares about his people. A good leader does that. A bad leader is so self-absorbed. Woe to you, O land. That is, this is a grievous evil. It implies there's deep suffering. That there is a great injustice. So verse 17. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Now, if you're a leader and you want to be a good leader, this is a good verse. This is a good passage to help us understand leadership because the word nobility can also be understood as integrity, honor, or moral character. The word happy is the same word that we see in the Beatitudes, blessed. It's, it's the, the Hebrew and the Greek word kind of have a parallel understanding. There is a blessedness. There is a joy. The people are blessed when they have a leader that leads with honor and integrity and has moral character. The leader does the right thing at the right time with the right people in the right place, and they put other people first. Good leaders put other people before them. They don't live for themselves. The result of this is a nation that is stronger and a people who will fight and die for a godly king or a good king. Verse 18. Through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. Now, this is just simply saying this. A wise person takes care of their own house. You must attend to the needs of your own home or it will fall apart. Um, Jesus said there were two great commands. The first command was to love the Lord with everything that you have, all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and all your strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there are some people who have said, well, you got to love yourself because if you don't love yourself, you can't love other people. That's not what the verse is saying. It's not saying to become so self-absorbed that you can finally love people. You know, when I love myself, I reach self-actualization. If you're a big fan of Maslow, I'm not. What the verse is saying is just like you care for your own needs, just like you take care of your needs, you take care of yourself, love others in that way. This verse is saying that... If you don't take care of your house, it'll fall apart. In other words, don't follow anyone who can't even take care of their own home, who can't take care of their own family, who doesn't take care of themselves. They're not worth following. A good steward, a good person attends to the needs of their own home. Amen? I mean, there's some people that, like, after church, saying, I, I got some work to do. That's good. You should. It's, it's good to take care of your own house. In other words, it's okay to be selfish in this aspect. You know, if, if you're ever flown on a plane, Danny, you've flown how many years in the sky? <laughs> they give a little safety talk. And, and one of the things they say is, if the cabin should lose pressure, a little mask will fall. And then they say, what you should do when that mask falls is help everybody else and then take care of yourself last, because that's the best thing to do, Right? No, the best thing to do is put the mask on you first and then help other people. Well, this verse is kind of implying that. Take care of your own home. Make sure your affairs are in order. Fix the roof. Make sure everything's going to be okay. And then you're able to help other people. Verse 19. This is probably the most controversial verse in the whole book. 
Because I've had people say, what do you do with this verse? What do you do? Money answers everything. The Bible says money answers everything. In the context of everything that we've been reading, let's understand this verse. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. When you work smart, you work hard, you take care of your home, you're wise, and you set yourself up for success, there is a much greater chance for laughter and a glad wife, a glad life, a full glass of wine, if you have those things. If you're not a good worker and you don't take care of yourself, you probably don't have a lot of laughter, you probably can't afford wine, and you probably have no money. You see, the context for all of this is being a good worker. We need to work. God has given us an ability to work. If you have that ability, I really realize not everybody has the ability to work. There are some people that I know that have been confined to a wheelchair, and they would love more than anything to get up and work a hard, vigorous eight-hour day. This verse seen in the light, uh, this verse seen in the light that there are no free handouts. I don't know if that made sense to you or not, but there are no free handouts. If something's too good to be true, finish it. It probably is. If you want something good, you have to work for it. You have to earn it. That there's, there's great joy and satisfaction in working hard and saving money and being able to provide for your needs. There is a great satisfaction in not being dependent on somebody else to provide for your needs. Amen? Amen. And if you work hard and you work smart and you take care of yourself, you will have bread in the cupboard. You will have wine, or grape juice if you're Baptist, and money. Because a wise person is just wise. Verse 20. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. Can I just share with you, this is just a common sense thing. If you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. You know, here's the reality. This is speaking negatively of your boss. It's really easy to criticize the boss. It is. Yet, you probably have no idea how much stress your boss has. You probably have no idea all the things that the boss is dealing with. You see, you only see one small part of it. Your boss may be under a lot of pressure. There might be a lot of expectations. There might be a lot of demands on your supervisor. And you doing your thing, it's easy to criticize the boss because you don't have full understanding. But let me just share with you something that happens. When you do and your boss is under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure, it's really easy for that boss to say, well, I don't need you. You know what? This is the truth. Ron and I have talked about this. There are no secrets. Whatever you say to somebody, odds are it'll make its way around. If you speak bad about the boss, it's just a matter of time before the boss finds out. So you're better off keeping all negative thoughts, all negative words to yourself. There's just wisdom in that. The wisdom is if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Why? Because you need to work. If you don't like your boss and you don't like your work, go find a new job. That takes us to the end of chapter 20, or chapter 10, verse 20. And I ended on time. God is good. Yeah, we can clap. That's a miracle. 